There are a few things about the Jumu'ah that I wish to speak about, specifically about the history of Jumu'ah. Jumu'ah became fard upon this Ummah while Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa was still in Makkah. But circumstances beyond his control made it such that he and the Sahaba with him could not make Jumu'ah at the time. When the first Sahaba started emigrating to Medina Munawwara, Mus'hab ibn Umayr and others, then Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sent along with him the command to start the first Jumu'ah, while he himself was still in Makkah. So the first Jumu'ah was established in Medina Munawwara under the Imam of Mus'hab ibn Umayr and the leaders of the Ansar. And thereafter Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa eventually made Hijrah himself and Jumu'ah became one of the most important fundamental cornerstones of social life in Islam. But it is not so much the general Islamic history of Jumu'ah that I wish to focus upon as I, uh, in this message that I uh, convey to you uh, on this eve of Jumu'ah. It is more the history of Jumu'ah in the Cape. I wish to speak specifically to the people of the Cape. And I wish to commend them once again before going to the history. I wish to commend them for the manner in which they responded to the call of the Muslim Judicial Council to the extent that 97% of the masajid in Cape Town did not have Jumu'ah when it was called for. The people of Cape Town must be commended for that. I want to speak about Jumu'ah in Cape Town over the centuries. We know that Islam came to the Cape not long after Jan van Riebeek in 1652. For the first 150 years of Muslim presence at the Cape, neither Jumu'ah Salah nor Jama'ah Salah was allowed. Somehow or the other Muslims managed to hold on to their deen. With Jumu'ah, without Jumu'ah, with Jama'ah Salah, without it. They managed to maintain their deen for 150 years, not three weeks, four weeks and five months. For 150 years they managed to hold on to their deen. Then in 1793, Tuanguru applied to the authorities for permission to start a masjid and start having Jumu'ah. His application was bluntly refused. Tuanguru eventually took the Muslim community to a disused quarry in the Buka and without a, a masjid, they went and they established a Jumu'ah. It was an understanding of those great leaders of ours back then that for this community to establish itself as a Muslim community and to ensure its survival into the future, Jumu'ah is an important ingredient. So despite the fact that they were not allowed to have a masjid, they went to the quarry and they had a Jumu'ah. The Awal Masjid would be established, the Madras of the Awal Masjid would be established not very long thereafter, but all of this without, uh, public appro with, with, uh, without governmental approval. The watershed change came in the year 1806. In 1806, the British invaded the Cape for the second time under Admiral Byrd. And they took place what is known in the history of South Africa as the Battle of Bloberg. So as the British were sailing down to attack the Cape, General Janssens was trying to put together a motley crew of whichever soldiers he could find, anyone to defend the Cape. They called together whichever regiments they were, whoever had any military training, and then they turned to the Malay community, the Muslim community. They say, we need your help as well. We need you to participate in the defense of the Cape. At that moment, Muslims realized the opportunity that were put in front of them. They said, by all means, we will defend, we will assist with the task of defending the Cape, provided we are given our religious freedom to practice our religion publicly and have our Jama'a Salah and have our Jumu'ah. This was negotiated, it was settled. General Janssens came to Tuanguru with a ceremonial dagger which he handed over to him as uh, investiture of the head of the Muslim community that will now put together uh, the Muslim um, military force. Tuanguru was very old at that time. This was just a few years before his eventual passing away. I think he passed away that very same year or the following year. Tuanguru was very old. He asked General Janssen to take this dagger and hand it over to Imam Franz from Bengalan. Imam Franz would lead the troops in, in battle. Two Muslim uh, groups of soldiers were formed. They were called the Yafansa Artillery and the Light Yafansa Artillery. These two groups were formed under the command of a French officer and the command 
of Imam Franz van Bengal. They took their lines. Six, the 16 guns for the defense of the Western Cape, of the Cape at the time, were given to the Jafans artillery. They had to handle the guns. A much superior force attacked them, the British attacked them. A number of the other regiments, the Waldecker regiment, ran without sh shooting a single shot. Without firing a single shot, ran from the battlefield. General Janssens and his troops receded from Bloberg right up to Ilanskloof in the Ottentots Holland region where I am speaking to you from at this moment in time. The one party of soldiers that stood and could not be moved from their position was, and we say it with great pride, the Muslim soldiers of the Western Cape. The Muslim soldiers of the Cape stood and acquitted themselves so well of their task that Captain Smart of the 72nd Highland, uh, the Highlanders, one of the companies of the British forces that took the Cape at the time, commended them for the excellent way in which they handled their guns. They had only 16 guns. General Byrd would go on to write that we imagined that they had about 23 guns for the manner in which the Muslims handled their guns on that day. When everyone fled, they stood. On that day, something very important happened. Muslims up to that moment had been people who had been imported as soldiers, as servants, as slaves, as political prisoners to the Cape. On this day, they decided we are citizens of this country. And as citizens of this country, we will bring our part, we will contribute what we can. And they did it in a manner that outshone all the others on the battlefield of Lauberg on that day. To the extent that when the British took the Cape, the British fulfilled the promises of granting them masajid and granting them the freedom to practice their social lives as Muslims. And Jumu'ah and Jama'ah from that moment onwards became a very noticeable feature of life at the Cape. It became so noticeable in fact that there's this little anecdote which I wish to share with you. I was once listening to Radio Sonar Khrensa, our Afrikaans radio station. And the discussion was about how empty the churches are running. And then someone phones in, and this person is a non-Muslim himself, and he says, you are speaking about how empty the churches are. Has anyone ever noticed on a Friday how Muslims who are not uh, off at that moment in time, they leave their work, they take off from their work, they go to their mosques where they double park and triple park and the mosques overflow, there's not a single masjid. Whether it's in the CBD or in the outskirts of Cape Town, not a single masjid that on a Friday is not overflowing with worshippers. And this non-Muslims are taking note of it. And as he's mentioning it, my breast swells with pride. This is the Muslim community. They understand they might not have been there for Fajr that morning, might not be there tomorrow night for Isha. But Jumu'ah is an important aspect of their lives. It is that very same Jumu'ah which we are today asked to sacrifice for the greater good of the community and in the interests of good citizenship, in the interest uh, that the community might live.